we're going to start with the press conference right now. So if the press want to come up and ask questions, uh, first we'll start off with uh, Arjun Makajani and we'll let him make a short statement and then we'll just go down the line to Dr. Moser and Dr. Restikoff. Hi, I'm Arjun Makajani. I'm president of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research. Um, most people don't realize that once a nuclear power plant is shut operationally for power generation, um, a large part of the risk still remains. Uh, we're more aware of it since the Fukushima accident, but I think Robert Alvarez and I were the first, after the Fukushima accident commenced, to call attention to the spent fuel pools at that site. And there are, of course, spent fuel, two spent fuel pools still operational at the San Onofre site, and there's a fair amount of dry storage all of the Unit 1 uh, casts are in dry storage. Uh, there are usually when people have calculated the risks from fuel pool fires, uh, they have attended to the cesium-137 source term because cesium evaporates. It was the thing that was emitted most at Chernobyl and also at Fukushima to the air after the explosions there in 2011. Uh, in terms of the long-lived radionuclides. Uh, but there's also another danger, which is now becoming manifest at Fukushima, which is uh, that strontium-90, which is present in very similar amounts in spent fuel, is not volatile, so it doesn't evaporate when there's a fire, uh, but it is present, and in contact with water, it is more easily mobilized from the spent fuel. So if you look at some of the Fukushima numbers now, uh, you see that groundwater is more contaminated, some samples at least, with strontium-90, many times more contaminated than with cesium-137. And this site, of course, is similar to the Fukushima site in the, in the sense that it's on the ocean. And so if there is a spent fuel pool fire due to an accident or, or uh, a terrorist attack, then uh, you also have uh, damaged spent fuel with strontium-90 may be exposed to runoff, rain, storms, fallout, and so on, and, and be, um, not, not fallout, uh, runoff and rain and storms. And therefore, you might get ocean contamination with strontium-90, which, which bioaccumulates quite strongly in, in, in fish and bones and so on. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing that I've become more and more aware of over the last year is that San Onofre, like uh, most other power plants in the last 10, 15 years, has been using what is called high burn-up fuel. That is, how much energy do you produce out of um, the fuel rods that you put in? And this has been allowed to uh, reduce the number of refuelings, so allow longer operation without stopping of nuclear power plants. And so as a result, the fuel rods are hotter. Uh, after 10 years, the fuel rods are about twice as hot uh, thermally as, as um, in terms of uh, thermal power generation as they would be with low burn-up fuel. Uh, San Onofre seems to have exceeded the, the highest burn-up here seems to have exceeded the levels that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission seems to speak about in their environmental impact statement uh, in terms of worrying about disposal. So that's kind of a mystery and I wondered whether San Onofre had explicit authorization to exceed the 62.5 gigawatt day per ton limit. San Onofre are also going to confront some very strong dilemmas. People agree that dry storage is generally safer than spent fuel pool storage. Uh, each dry cask has smaller amounts of radioactivity, much smaller amounts of radioactivity. By my calculation, a similar fire in a dry cask to a spent fuel pool would, would cause about 1.5% of the emissions as a spook, a dry cask fire that released 10% of its radioactivity would cause about 1.5% of the emissions compared to a similar scale fire in a pool, because there's much more radioactivity in the pool. But for high burn-up fuel, the NRC has now allowed high burn-up fuel without thinking about long-term storage. It's not clear to me, uh, because there is no real data on whether longer term storage in spent fuel pools is better or worse than longer term storage in dry casks. And finally, because we don't have a geologic repository, 
the NRC is now thinking that there may be on-site storage for hundreds of years or maybe forever, and that we would have to tr transfer from one dry cask to another as they wear out, and nobody has considered, the NRC has explicitly said, we don't really know how to transfer damaged spent fuel from one cask to another in response to a petition uh, from Minnesotans. Uh, and they said, we'll worry about that when we come to it because we will know the fuel is damaged. Well, there are 95 damaged fuel assemblies that are already stored at San Onofre, so we know there are damaged fuel assemblies, and the NRC doesn't seem to be very eager to deal with it. And finally, I think it's very important for us who oppose nuclear power and don't think it's very sensible I don't think it's sensible to make plutonium just to boil water and spend a lot of money doing it. Uh, that you put a limit to the amount of spent fuel we generate, but, but we also need to think through what we're going to do about geologic repositories because we've had a terrible failed program in this country. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Don Mosier. I'm a professor in the Department of Immunology and Microbial Sciences at Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla, California. I'm also a council member from the city of Del Mar. Uh, I've been following the uh, issues at San Onofre closely for several years, and I, I, just one year ago, there was a meeting of the NRC in Laguna Beach um, at which I testified, and I was amazed to hear one of the Southern California Edison representatives state that radiation is good for you. Uh, I've worked as a consultant for the National Cancer Institute, and uh, I'm okay. And uh, I follow the latest data on cancer research very closely. And I will tell you that uh, in my presentation, I'm going to make two big points. One is that the current exposure guidelines for radiation are 20 years out of date and far too high. And secondly, in the last five years, in the era of cancer genomics, we've learned how many mutations are associated with cancer, how many mutations directly cause cancer, and that explains why the risk of very low-dose radiation is so high. And we need to update our exposure guidelines dramatically. And I'll in one uh, important illustration of this point, the National Institute of Medicine two years ago issued a report that said women under the age of 40 who do not have any family history of breast cancer should not undergo mammography because the risk of cancer associated with that radiation dose is higher than the environmental background risk. That dose is a fraction of a millisievert, and yet the exposure the San Onofre workers allowed to experience each year is 50 millisieverts. So when I say that the current guidelines for exposure are far too generous, we're talking about a log order 10 to 100 fold too generous. So I'm going to present some of the hard science for those of you who like hardcore science uh, in my talk, but the facts are very clear that very low dose irradiation is dangerous. The cancer is caused by many mutations, but it's the last mutation that you have that pushes you over the edge. And that last mutation doesn't take much radiation or insult to cause. Uh, my name is Marvin Reznikov, uh, and I'm from Vermont now. Uh, Vermont is where we are closing down a reactor in another year, Vermont Yankee Reactor. So we are part of what's called the anti-nuclear renaissance. <laughs> as opposed to what the industry has been calling the nuclear renaissance. Uh, I am going to talk about, I'm going to talk about decommissioning 101 and 
Arjun is going to talk about decommissioning 102. He's going to fill in all the details I've missed. Uh, but I'm going to talk about what does San Onofre look like now? Where is the radioactivity? Uh, I'm going to talk about the radiation levels that are in each part of the reactor uh, and why it's a, a difficult task to decommission these facilities. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should mention that I also work for the state of Nevada on transportation issues. Uh, and we are very concerned about high burn-up fuel because the cladding, the, these, and these fuel assemblies are along uh, at um, San Onofre, they're extremely long. I, I was surprised to see that uh, they're on the order of 14 and a half feet long. Uh, and they have these thin tubes where the fuel pellets are inside. Uh, and these thin tubes can become very brittle, uh, particularly as the burn-up, as the amount of time that these, this fuel stays in the reactor uh, is longer. Uh, and that makes it difficult if there's a potential accident, then it's uh, more likely that fuel will, these, the fuel cladding will shatter and uh, the material inside will then uh, get into the canister and if the accident is severe enough, can also get out into the environment. So I'm very concerned about that aspect of high burn up fuel, that it has high, highly brittle fuel cladding which can uh, shatter in an accident. So I'm gonna talk about all of that and also about what decommissioning means at San Onofre, what's gonna be left at San Onofre once they decommission it. Uh, gonna talk a little about the economics, whether there's enough money there to, to take care of the problem. Uh, my name is Yoko Kubota, I'm a documentary filmmaker and I'm developing a film regarding uh, Fukushima nuclear disaster and related with IAEA as well as um, <coughs> nuclear waste. Uh, how we're going to pursue this, the nuclear waste. The, my question is, um, who is initiating to invent a new technology that uh, safely decomposing the nuclear waste? And if there is one organization or one particular uh, scientist, and then uh, how much is the annual budget? And then where are they getting the money from? Uh, radioactivity can be eliminated in two ways, or dealt with in two ways. One is just its natural decay. So every radioactive material has its own decay time. Iodine-131 is eight days. Cesium-137 is, is 30 years. Plutonium is 24,000 plus years, and so on. So people have proposed that for the longer lived elements, like plutonium, some can be used as fuels, that you can use it as a fuel and split it up into fission products and deal with the very long-lived elements that way. Uh, there are a couple of problems with that approach. So people have done this and proposed it, and to some extent, plutonium is extracted from spent fuel in France and used as fuel in light water reactors. But in order to do that, first of all, you have to take the spent fuel and process it and separate it out. So that's called reprocessing. You, you have it in Japan, um, uh, in, at Tokai Mura, and at the new plant, Rokasho Mura. So this actually aggravates all. Generally, any attempt to reduce the, half, reduce the lifetimes of nuclear materials by transmuting them into other radionuclides, you have to separate them first. This causes a tremendous amount of cost. But even aside from cost, it causes a tremendous amount of pollution. And then you are left with more radioactive materials and waste at the end because they're radioactive waste that arise from the process. Uh, in any case, there are a number of radioactive materials that, that you cannot deal with in this way. And so m the technology that you use to do these transmutations are mostly nuclear reactors. So you are building more re nuclear reactors to reduce <laughs> nuclear waste problems from nuclear reactors, which create more nuclear waste. So I, I think while in theory you can say that there is a physics by which you can transmute long-lived radionuclides into short-lived ones, 
the the practical consequences of trying to do that are much worse than just stopping to make more and so i looked into this for a long time there there are many techniques by which have been proposed photo transmutation and burning in reactors and so on none will solve the problem of long lived some wrong, long lived radionuclides all involve some kind of nuclear reactor or chain reactions uh, all or creating more fission products um, all involve separation of nuclear materials which increase proliferation dangers because you have to separate plutonium and neptunium and so on so weapons usable materials so i think um, while the physicists say you can do it, the practical idea of doing it actually makes the problem worse rather than better, in my mind. That's why I think we should actually have deep geologic repositories. Thank you so much. I think the second part of your question is who is funding uh, this type of work? Well, nuclear, nuclear establishments in France and other countries are looking into transmutation, but I, I think if... And, if you go to our website, ieer.org, you'll find a report on transmutation where this is discussed at some length. Hi, uh, my name's Donna Gilmore. I live a few miles from the plant. Um, I think one of the questions she was asking is, since we don't have a solution for the waste, who's behind pushing for new reactors, and where's the money coming from? Was that your question? But that's part of it. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, well, the nuclear industry is pretty rich and powerful. You know, the Nuclear Energy in the Institute in this country spends a great deal of money pushing for nuclear reactors. Uh, utilities, not so much, you know, but they'll build reactors if the federal government gives them loan guarantees and the ratepayers give them money. It's no risk to them, so they, they spend somebody else's money to build reactors, which is what is happening in this country. In other countries, when there are very centralized utility systems or government owned utility systems as in France or, or, or in China and Japan I think is privately owned but very very centralized and controlled in a coalition between government and industry those are the only places where or India where nuclear power is being promoted by the bureaucracies that are that have a vested interest in it sometimes local communities that are poor and don't have jobs but people also may say you know we want the construction jobs as happened sometimes it happened in south carolina for example or georgia here uh, they may argue for it but mainly the interest in the nuclear industry themselves are pushing for this but using other people's money to do it not putting their own money at risk well, the, the fact is that uh, there isn't an increase in the number of nuclear reactors in this country. Uh, in fact, that's on a decline. Uh, six were canceled uh, this year, and several that were ordered were canceled. Uh, so, in fact, the number of reactors that are in operation right now in this country is, is on the decline. You have a question here? Just a follow-up. Okay, that. Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, my name's Gary Hedrick, and I had a follow-up question. I think it was from what the reporter was starting to ask, but is there any interest or discussion going on currently to spend the same kind of energy the nuclear industry is on promoting more nuclear energy? Is there a counterpart to that? Is there an organization maybe being formed on a global level to address what to do with waste and and have they got a budget, or is there anything like that being discussed in those circles? There is a whole NRC proceeding, Nuclear Regulatory Commission proceeding, uh, what's called the Waste Confidence Hearing. Uh, and that involves a lot of uh, the citizen groups around the country. Uh, and that specifically applies to what is going to happen to the waste materials in the long term. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but there are a lot of public interest groups that are addressing this question. So what you're saying right now, the, attending these uh, waste confidence meeting uh, is the best way for uh, the public to uh, get involved in this process. But of course, ours was canceled on October 9th, but they are going to reschedule. One good source of information that's an organization I belong, have belonged to for 40 years, the Union of Concerned Science. Yeah. It's, and they have excellent information for anybody who wants to it. It's a 501c3, so 
their budget is probably 0.001% of the nuclear industry, um, but it's a very good source for information. You, you ask about global, there's no, there's the International Atomic Energy Authority, and they, you know, they do meetings and coordination and make publications on nuclear waste and nuclear reactors, nuclear energy in general, and weapon proliferation and inspections. Uh, mostly the coordination on spent fuel and waste happens um, more informally on an ad hoc basis. You know, they have conferences, meetings, papers, uh, panels. Uh, so there is a, some amount of coordination among the official bodies responsible for waste, and they may have joint programs. For instance, there are joint European programs among uh, the French and other countries to, to do experiments in, in, in uh, underground locations. So, uh, there is a fair amount of work. Their budgets, don't, probably the repository organization's budgets are in the hundreds of millions or cumulatively certainly in the billions of dollars. But um, on, the, on the public side, I'm not aware that there is a global counterpart. Oh, hi. This is for Dr. Mosier. Um, I'm Chris Johnston. I probably live about six miles from the plant. And um, I'm just wondering if there are epidemiological studies of the San Onofre workers. And um, if so, does, does the NRC not need to respond to the CDC or whatever organizations that are responsible for the health of the workers? That's one question. And also, how do or did San Onofre get away with releasing radiation without letting people know who live in the community how much radiation is released and on what day? So that's my first question. Uh, uh, thank you for those questions, Christine. Um, I've looked hard trying to find data on uh, surveys of workers at San Onofre, and I have found no reliable data. They do have a survey program for uh, nuclear workers, um, but those results are, are, are not available in any quantitative sense that you can make any understanding of. The same is true of release data. We know that there are peaks of release, uh, uh, there are tritium releases that, that one can detect, but the amount of, of radioactivity released and its dispersal is not routinely monitored. If you go over the state monitoring data, you find that most times there's a report that says no detectable level of radioactivity. But in fact, that's very distant monitoring and very poor monitoring. So unfortunately, the answer to your question is we don't know. Now, in my presentation, I'm going to talk about the best study done on nuclear workers, which is the 15-country European study. And there, there is a clear impact of long-term radiation exposure on health and cancer incidents in nuclear workers. And if you extrapolate from those results, you would say that workers at San Onofre in the plant would have a lifetime doubling of cancer risk. So we talk about in the community, we also need to be concerned about the workers who are right in the plant and are on the front line of exposure. Um, and the NRC has really not dealt with this issue at all. Uh, you know that the EPA exposure limits are about tenfold lower than the NRC limits. The NRC limits make no sense in terms of our current understanding of cancer risk. Um, and the, the real data that you need to collect is not being collected in the United States. You can, you can find the environmental reports for each nuclear power plant on the NRC's website. They're required to file environmental reports. And you can get annual totals uh, for some radionuclides, at least, in these environmental reports of releases both to the air and water. Uh, but as you just heard, um, they, they're not continuously monitored. So, and in my opinion, the NRC is not looking very closely over the shoulder of the company. So for instance, tritium is released periodically. But I'm not sure when the measurements are made, and that's not documented in the environmental reports. Are the water measurements made during the release? How are the averages reported? Um, how are the totals calculated? In fact, you know, the releases from similar plants are quite... You might also be interested to know that most nuclear power plants, all nuclear power plants of our variety, like water reactors, release tritium to the atmosphere. So you will have, you can expect radioactive rainfall around 
uh, nuclear power plants. We have asked the NRC to require monitoring of rainfall because people have private wells in many places, uh, but they have refused uh, to require it. Yeah, let, let me just expand on the tritium monitoring. The problem with the data is that uh, the tritium releases are, are episodic, so they'll have a release of tritium one day a month, but then when, when they report that to NRC, they'll say, this is the amount of tritium we released over the year, and if you, you know, you have five days of release, but you divide that by 365 days, it doesn't look like so much tritium, but if you're sitting right next to the plant on the day of the release, it's quite a bit. Now there's some data from Europe that says that those spikes are dangerous, but there's no data in the U.S. that you can interpret. Uh, Thank you. I, I just want to add that there have been studies of children around nuclear power plants in Europe and those show an increase in leukemia among children. Uh, and similar studies are going to be done, or are being done right now in this country, but we don't have the results yet. Just started, actually. Yes, uh, and that actually, San Onofre area, San Clemente, is one of the six cities that is uh, scheduled to be, to have this epidemiology study done. So we will be uh, getting that at some point in the future. They haven't scheduled, they haven't told us when. They may even do it privately. Uh, without telling people uh, that they're coming to town, but they are going to do it, and we're one of six locations in the country uh, set for that. The other, the other thing that's really necessary to remember is that the NRC sets these regulations, and they're they're calculated in such a fashion, as they mentioned, that allow these things to happen, and they say it, it's in uh, within regulation. And of course, they haven't done the studies to see how it's affecting us. At least we will be one of six communities getting, uh, getting uh, a study done soon. Hi, I'm Brooke Staggs with the Orange County Register. With the situation the way it is now at the plant, if you were able to help draft the decommissioning plan, what would be your recommendation? What would that look like in an ideal situation? You're on the decommissioning 101, you go first. Oh. <laughs> Is the question, uh, what would I do if I were the Wazar? What would, what, I, what would I do at San Onofre if... Well, what do you want, the bad news first? Um, I think the waste is going to be here for some time. Um, when I looked at uh, what uh, the um, economics, it's San Onofre, uh, Southern Cal was saying, the spent fuel will be removed by the year 2034 from the fuel pool. I mean, it could be removed sooner. At any rate, I see a 20-year period where the fuel is slowly being removed from the pool. Um, it would take some time before uh, the reactor is taken apart. Um, so what I see in the future is Essentially, uh, I don't know what to call it. The new homes f facility is, should I call it a mausoleum? <laughs> These are casts that sit on the side in, in a storage, uh, concrete storage facility. And I see that happening here at San Onofre as I see it happening at reactors in other parts of the country. Some have... Uh, fuel in uh, concrete silos, or what I call the Stonehenge concept of uh, waste disposal. But I see casts sitting all around the country uh, because essentially there's nowhere to take the material. Um, I see, the, the, supposedly the Department of Energy is going to pay for all of this storage and eventually transport it to some location uh, which is not known at the present time. The San Onofre uh, economics report says by the year 2020, they're going to start removing the fuel from the site. I think that's highly optimistic uh, that there's actually going to be a place to take the fuel to, uh, unless they're thinking of some desert location somewhere. Uh, so that's what I see as the end game right now, as far as I can tell. Uh, there will be casts that sit at the site. Uh, the site, the buildings will eventually be taken down. Uh, 
and that's what, that's the way I see it. So, um, Marvin, you, you mentioned a point there that's really very important for people to to uh, to understand. You mentioned that the DoD is going to be paying them uh, Edison to store. So, not only are they going to get paid by us to decommission, at the same time they're going to be double dipping with the the Department of Energy, getting paid to store the uh, the uh, radioactivity on site, which means they have no real interest in moving it quickly because they're going to be getting paid for it. So well, for some reason, though, the economic reports that uh, uh, SoCal has filed uh, have a charge for taking care of all that fuel, even though they're going to be reimbursed by the Department of Energy for doing that. And that's a cost of over $300 million for each San Onofre 2 and 3. So I'm quite confused when I look at their reports as to why they're not taking into account this reimbursement from the federal government. And we came to the same conclusion. We're very confused about that, too. Our team that's watching out over the CUP actions, uh, they have caught that one. So we'll, we'll be working on that one as well. Could, could I supplement a couple of things? Um, I was just talking with Donna before the start of the program. Uh, as many of you know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission authorized the burning of fuel for longer periods of time so that the fuel that has been burned for the last 10, 15 years is much hotter uh, and contains more radioactive waste per fuel rod than, than the older stuff. Um, we don't have any practical empirical knowledge about the degradation of this material over time, either in wet storage or dry storage. And um, it's unclear to me, at least, uh, it's clear that during reactor operation, this fuel gets more damaged as it's, it's, it has more oxides, it hydrides more, it gets thinner, it's more vulnerable, therefore, to the buildup of gases and to breaking apart. Um, and the NRC and other bodies ha have recognized this problem. It's unclear to me at the present time, and pending further research, whether it may be desirable to leave some of the highest burn up by desirable, you know, the least awful option, to leave it in spent fuel pools or to put it in dry cast storage, um, not knowing how long it's going to be there and whether if the fuel is damaged and you need to change casks that you will be able to do it. Uh, the NRC has refused so far. So uh, that's one point. It's, there are some unknowns there that we should, there are known unknowns. Uh, that we should worry about. The second thing is I think we should, the current dry cask storage is deficient in that it is not as resistant to terrorist attack as it should be. We have advocated hardened on-site storage and I'm going to talk about that in some detail. Uh, it may cost a little bit more, but I think um, it, 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 the extra costs are pennies per month, even if they were all per home even if they were paid entirely by ratepayers, pennies per month over 10 years. My name is Rin Yamada. I'm a newspaper journalist in Japan. My question is, do you think the number of closure of nuclear power plants in the U.S. will be increasing in the near future? And if yes, which plants do you think will be shut down and why? Well, the oldest plants obviously are the ones that are prime. Uh, generally, they're smaller, they're less economic. Um, the, and particularly the ones that are similar to Fukushima. Uh, Vermont Yankee is the same generation as uh, the Fukushima plant. Uh, we've called for it to be closed uh, because these boiling water reactors have a fuel pool which is sitting way up in the air at Vermont Yankee, it's sitting 63 feet above uh, the, the ground level. Uh, and that's the way the, these boiling water reactors are uh, constructed. Um, so definitely, the, if I were to choose, I would say the boiling water reactors of Mark I vintage, uh, similar to the Fukushima reactors, are the ones that should be closed first. And they're generally the smaller ones as well. One quick thing. Um, wherever the 
new requirements that will come out of the Fukushima review, uh, either directly or uh, indirectly, uh, require significant investments, those plants will be likely to be shut. Here, of course, the most vulnerable, the only remaining plant in California is Diablo Canyon, and if they are required to have cooling towers by the California Coastal Water Commission, and if or and or if they are um, required to have seismic up up uh, seismic uh, up upgrades because of the seismic reevaluation that is going on now, um, that would probably be or possibly be a candidate, even though it's not as old or as as some of the plants that Marvin was talking about. So there are a number of that we have a similar uh, earthquake evaluation problem in in the southeast uh, and the east, and one doesn't know how exactly that is going to be factored in. But there are not a lot of there are only four new five new reactors under construction. Four plus one old one being finished. Um, so I think the trend of decreasing number of reactors is going to continue. Partly it's also because of cheap gas prices, mm. likely to persist. Libby Halevi, Nuclear Hot Seat. I'm wondering if, going back to the issue of neutralizing the radioactive waste, is there any familiarity, at least with the rumors, of the Roy method by Dr. Rod Thau Roy for knocking the neutrons off? And what do you see as the feasibility of that? Should the formula either be discovered, rediscovered, or uh, recreated? To the, to the, I, I've looked at this to some extent, and to the extent that I under, a little bit on the secretive side, but to the extent that I have understood it, it involves what is called phototransmutation. If you shoot very um, high energy photons, particles of light or radiation, um, at, at uh, radioactive materials, you're going to, you can transmute them. You can knock out a neutron. Uh, the trouble is that you knock out, uh, you can convert short-lived ones into long-lived ones, and long-lived ones into short-lived ones, all by the same process. And so as I said earlier, in order to just do the long-lived ones into short-lived ones, you have to first separate them. So for example, you need to separate out the cesium-135 from all the other cesiums, from the cesium-137. This is essentially impossible to do. Um, it, it's very, very difficult. I mean, in theory you could do it, but in practice you could not. And then you have to package this stuff. And it's this, essentially a nuclear reactor. It's a nuclear reactor in the form of an accelerator. And you create vast new amounts of radioactive waste when you do that. So, and you require separation. So you're going to separate the plutonium. Uh, you create proliferation risks when you do that. I'm, I'm completely against the separation of plutonium from, from spent fuel. And one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, I am against nuclear power is we're making 30 bombs worth of plutonium in every reactor of 1,000 megawatts every year. And the main danger is if we separate it. That's why spent fuel, in a way, is the safest form for this nuclear waste because the plutonium is locked up in all that other radioactive material. And if you approach it, you will die. And so you can't get at the plutonium easily the way it is. So I think we should leave it that way. 